Hello, precious friends. Welcome back to Aunt Patty's Kitchen on the Carnivore Hippie Channel. Today we're going to make something I've been promising you. Uh, we're going to work with the chicken flour that we made last time. And we're going to be making a bread substitute that is dairy-free. Most of the bread substitutes I've seen and that I've tried uh, center around dairy or at least have some dairy components, cream cheese, uh, Greek yogurt, mozzarella, stuff like that. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had something for the carnivore practitioners that don't do dairy or can't tolerate it. So uh, I'm pretty happy with what I've come up with and I'm going to show it to you today. So let's get started. First of all, uh, we're going to look at our hardware as we always do. First of all, we're going to need is a food processor fitted with a metal blade. I don't, I don't think you could make this in a blender. Maybe you could make it in a real powerful blender like uh, a Vitamix, Vitamix. But um, I wouldn't attempt it in a, in a regular jar blender. And the next we are going to have an 8 by 8 baking pan fitted in the bottom with a sheet of parchment. This just this looks funny because it's two little sheets of parchment that I just happen to have scraps that happened to fit. Uh, bottom of the pan is buttered. The parchment is pressed into the butter and then the top of the parchment is buttered. The sides of the pan are not buttered. And the reason why the sides of the pan are not buttered is because when you're using egg whites to leaven a uh, baked goods like we will be doing, it helps to have the cling on the sides of the pan to help uh, stabilize the crumb or the texture. Uh, egg white leavened uh, baked goods can have can suffer from slump, which is where as they cool, they sink, and all baked goods do that to a certain extent. But egg white leavened baked goods and uh, baked goods who don't that don't have starch tend to have a worse time of it. So we're going to use the stickiness on the sides of the pan to help keep the uh, finished product stable as it cools. And once it cools, that structure is going to stabilize a lot more and it won't slump anymore. So we're, this is taking off from an old method of making uh, angel food cake. Anybody who comes from a baking background and has made angel food cake knows that you're not supposed to butter the sides of the mold. So that's what we're going for. And our silicone scrapers, which I always have and I always use because I love them. They're so handy. We have a, something to beat up egg whites with. We're gonna be making a pretty stiff egg foam or meringue. And uh, ordinarily I'd use my stand mixer, but we only have four egg whites here and that seems like an awful lot to pull out just for four egg whites. And several bowls. We got a large bowl here where my eggs are already cracked in that we're gonna make our, our uh, beaten egg whites in, our meringue, and I'll show you how I separate the eggs in just a minute. A uh, medium-sized bowl. This is our chicken flour, which we'll get to, but a medium-sized bowl. Uh, you need a medium-sized bowl because we're going to doing, be doing a lot of mixing in this bowl, and you want to have enough room to be able to mix everything adequately without it slopping out of the bowl. And a smaller bowl to hold the egg yolks for the time being once we get started with that. Now... Uh, on to the, obviously, the software, which is four eggs, which will be separated. Here is 130 grams, which is four and a half ounces, a pinch more than four and a half ounces of the chicken flour that we made. Um, this bowl has about a quarter teaspoon of water in it, and that's just to keep the egg yolks from sticking to the bowl so that they'll come out of the bowl when we're ready for them to. 
and the rest of our software is mostly just uh, texturizers and flavor ingredients. So, as this is 90% uh, chicken and eggs. So we have here, for the chicken mass, we have two tablespoons or one ounce of butter. This is salted, you could use unsalted. If you didn't want to use butter, if you wanted to be completely dairy free, you could use uh, tallow or pork lard. If you wanted to, that would work absolutely fine. One ounce. This is a teaspoon of baking powder. Uh, this is an odd thing. Uh, this is a teaspoon of vanilla. And the reason we have this is because, believe it or not, this goes a long way in neutralizing the super chickeny taste of the chicken flour. It makes the finished product taste a lot more neutral. So if you don't mind your chicken bread tasting pretty dang chickeny, go ahead and leave it out. This is just for flavor. Uh, we have here a tablespoon of water and a half a teaspoon of unflavored gelatin powder. This is for texture. I don't suggest you leave it out. If you want to use grass-fed beef gelatin or something fancy, this is just regular old Knox gelatin that you buy at the store. But any kind of uh, unflavored gelatin will work. Collagen powder won't work. It needs to be gelatin, okay? Just to make that clear. Now over here, this is for the chicken mass that we will eventually be folding into the egg whites. I mean, this is for the egg whites that we will eventually be folding into the chicken mass. Ha ha, got it backwards. This is two tablespoons of allulose. Now this is for browning and it also works with the vanilla to neutralize the flavor of the chicken. Uh, you can leave this out if you want to, but the other thing it does is it helps to stabilize the egg whites significantly. It does not make the bread taste sweet. It creates um, an appropriate amount of browning. If you don't have this, your chicken loaf won't brown. It'll be the same color when it's done as it was when you put it in the oven. Uh, so um, if you do leave this out, I want you to be aware that it'll taste more chickeny and you may have some slumping. Uh, you may lose some of the rise and your loaf may be pretty dense or at least a lot denser than it would have been otherwise. So think carefully before you leave this out. Uh, a little bit of cream of tartar, which is to acidify our egg whites, which also helps to stabilize them. And a quarter of a teaspoon of xanthan gum. Again, if you have a objection to this, um, if you don't want to put it in, you want to leave it out, what is going to happen is uh, your egg whites won't be able to stand up to the folding as well, and you will again have a much denser end product. Okay, so just Keep in mind, the reason why we have all these little things here, all these little bits and bobs of things, is because this is what has given me what I consider the best texture and the best flavor for a bread substitute. And if you don't, you know, I suggest you at least try the recipe as written before you start going around making changes. But the only things that I suggest that you could actually leave out without any ill effects is going to be the vanilla. That's the only thing that is not going to have any uh, textural or anything but flavor effects. And the last thing is two tablespoons of egg white powder. Yeah, I know this recipe gets a little fussy, but what do you want? We're making bread out of chicken. Anyway... This is what I've worked up, folks, and this is the one that works. I've tried several other ones, and they don't work nearly as well. You end up getting something that tastes like a fat omelet with 
that tastes like eggs and chicken. And if, if you like that, I suppose you could do that, but that's not what I'm going for. Okay, so let's get going. Let's get to get to getting. So first we're gonna make our chicken mass. We're gonna be making a mass of chicken dough that we will be eventually beating our egg whites and folding them into to leaven it and make it bread-like in texture. So here we go. Here we have our 130 grams of chicken flour, prepared chicken flour. And we have our tablespoon, two tablespoons or one ounce of butter or other fat as pleases you. Our half, half teaspoon of um, unflavored gelatin not collagen, I may remind you. Our vanilla and our tablespoon of water. We're gonna save the baking powder for later because we don't wanna lose the loft of it. Here we go, we're gonna turn this on and we're gonna turn this into a dough. We're gonna pulse it first to distribute the ingredients. Get the butter chopped up. Once it's beginning to look like wet sand or breadcrumbs, we can just hit it and let it run. Now it looks like we looks like we don't have enough water in it. That's fine. We're gonna get ourselves another tablespoon or so of water. And we're just going to tip in a little bit, about a teaspoonful at a time, until uh, the dough forms a ball. It's gonna. There we go. I don't know if you can see the little ball that's going around in there. There's actually a couple of little balls. There we go. There it goes. Yay. So we had to add a whole nother tablespoon of water. If that's what you have to do, you have to do it. It's hard to gauge the amount of uh, moisture that's in the chicken flour. The longer it sits in the refrigerator, mine's been in there three or four days, um, the, the drier it tends to get. So if you're making it fresh, you might not need to add very much water at all. If you've had it sitting in the refrigerator for several days, you might need to add a little more, just be aware. But this is gonna be about the consistency of cookie dough. heavy cookie dough, okay? And I forgot I needed yet another bowl. I always forget something. We're gonna get every little bit out of here that we can because I'm obsessive that way. There we go. Now, see this? It's about the consistency of cookie dough or biscuit dough. That's exactly what you want. If you, it's moist and it's soft, but yeah, 
about biscuit dough or like sugar cookie dough. There we go. We're gonna. S We're done with the food processor for the moment. And we are now going to move to separating our eggs. Now I have to wipe off my hands because when I touch that chicken dough, it has butter in it. So I don't want fat in my egg whites. This is the way I separate my eggs. And I always do it this way because... I used to use an implement, a like egg separator device, and I was always losing it. It just wasn't convenient. And I used to, you know, do the bit where you tip back and forth between two broken eggshells, and that always seemed to be dangerous. So I saw a French lady on a PBS station do this years and years and years ago, and I have done it this way ever since. It's really easy. The eggs should be a little cold because the yolks are more stable. But you just dip your fingers into the bowl, scoop up the egg white just like that, and you just jiggle it a little bit. And the white falls right off. Put it in our bowl over here. This has a tiny bit of water in it. Uh, and it helps the egg, white, egg yolks slide out later on when we need them. About a quarter of a teaspoon. Dip underneath. Just raise your fingers. Jiggle a little bit. Come on. There we go. Two. Three, don't worry about th this. This is called the Kalazi. You don't want this. You don't want to try and remove this because it, it will often bust your yolk and you don't want this in your meringue anyway. It'll go just fine in with the rest of the yolks. So don't worry about separating that. There, that one was easy. There you go. Easy peasy. No fuss, no muss. No tipping back and forth between broken eggshells. Which failed for me about 30% of the time, which was really, really annoying. This fails for me maybe 5% of the time. So I'm going to take it. So now the next thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to beat up these egg whites. Now this darn thing is convenient but noisy so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pause the video I'm gonna get this started and and show you how to add the the extra thing you know the stuff that we're adding to the egg yolks but then when I go on to finish beating I'm probably gonna just pause the video because this thing is annoying as heck to listen to so before we get started, we have our egg whites, four egg whites, and we're just going to put a pinch of cream of tartar in here to acidify the egg yolk, uh, egg whites, because that makes them more stable. Or you can use um, citric acid if you have it. I do have it. Use a little bit less citric acid than you would use cream of tartar, but just a pinch. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to whip these up until they just start to get good and foamy. They won't be a stable meringue, but they'll be good and foamy. And then we'll stop and we will add the rest of our ingredients. So here we go. This is really going to be noisy, I warn you.
we go. It's a good foam built up. It's not it's not anywhere near a stable meringue yet, but it's nice and foamy, and that's what we want. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to stir our xanthan gum into our allulose. Okay, you can't just dump the xanthan gum in here because if you do, it'll turn into little bumps, little dumplings. You don't want that. You need a dispersal agent. So we're going to stick this in with our allulose. That's going to disperse it beautifully. And we won't have to worry about any xanthan gum lumps. Let's get that nice and stirred in there. Remember to keep your implements when you're working with egg white powder and with xanthan gum. All of your implements must be kept completely dry until you introduce the ingredient into the mixture. Otherwise, you're going to have trouble and you may end up having to start over again. So, absolutely dry. So we're going to sprinkle this in. We're going to give it a little bit of another mix. So we mix it in and now we're going to sprinkle in our egg white powder. Now the egg white powder, excuse me, the egg white powder is going to be lumpy, uh, but that's okay. I'm going to stir this around a little bit. The egg white powder is going to be lumpy. It's going to stick to the sides a little bit. That's okay. It will break up as we go along. Don't worry about the lumps. Okay, that's good enough. Now, we're going to beat this for as long as it takes to form a stable, dense meringue. It should look like Swiss meringue cake icing, or the kind of meringue, the stiff meringue that you use to pipe out meringue cookies with. Um, it's gonna be really dense, really creamy looking, and really stable. So you just have to keep going until it happens. I can't tell you how long that's gonna take. So we're gonna get going, and I'm gonna do this for a minute, and then I'm probably gonna pause the video until we're done. As you can see, we're about uh, halfway there. I'm just going to keep going until, until we get there. And I'll see you back again here when I'm done. Welcome back, precious friends. We're done. And you can see this looks a, an awful lot like marshmallow fluff. It If you can see down here how it stands up. Can you see? Oh, there you can see it now. The peak. There you go. That's what you want. It looks a lot like marshmallow icing. And that's what you want. Because of the xanthan gum and the allulose, it's it's very, very stable. And you have to have that because we're about to, frankly, beat it up a good deal. And it needs to be able to take it. 
So here we go. Here we have our chicken dough, and we're going to go to stage two on the chicken dough. Stage two on the chicken dough. We're going to go get our big bowl again. As I said, we needed a big bowl. Break this up a little bit. And we are going to put our egg yolks in one at a time. Now you could put them all in at once. I mean, the, the only reason that I tell you to put them in one at a time is because it really does, it really is easier to get this mixed up uniformly if you put them in one at a time. But that's really the only reason. So if you want to just dump them all in and go, um, but I find that you spend less time mixing actually by putting them in one at a time than by putting them in all at once. Whenever you're mixing a loose mixture into a very, very heavy mixture, put the loose mixture into the heavy mixture a little at a time. And that will assist you in getting uniformity. Come on. Last one. Oops. All right. Now you'll notice that the mixture has loosened up quite a bit. And it's going to loosen up even more because now we're going to put our baking powder in. And the reason why we've waited till this point is because this is double acting baking powder, just standard double acting baking powder. And it has two, uh, the, it's called double acting because it's going to have one rise when it hits the moisture in the bowl. So this is going to get way fluffier. And it'll have a second rise when it gets heated up in the pan. So I'm putting it in now because I want to maintain as much of that loft as possible. As I've said, we don't have any starch in this. So we don't have anything to lock that uh, loft into the matrix. So we're going to have to be very specific about how we manage uh, the rise, the leavening. So there we go. We don't want to overdo this because it's going to start to, to fluff up. I can actually already, I can actually see it getting bigger very, very slightly. It's, that's interesting. It's actually bigger than it was when we first started stirring it in. Just a little bit. And I have a visitor on my counter in the form of a little Missy cat. She hasn't come over here because I don't want her hair in the food, but there she is. No, you can't come over here. Naughty. Go on. Sorry. You go find somewhere else to play, darling. Bye. Anyway, yeah little naughty kitties. They want to be involved in everything. So, now, anyone who has done a lot of baking, who's come from the carnivore, come from, come to the carnivore lifestyle from a baking background is going to understand this. We're going to have to put this very heavy mixture into this very light and fluffy mixture. And the way we do this is by gradually increasing the fluffiness of this one until this one's loose enough that we can safely blend it into this one without losing the loft. And that's a French technique called liaison. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take, eh, that's maybe a fifth, a sixth of the mixture. And we're just going to, oh, look, you can see how much fluffier this is. Look at all the little air pockets. Can you see how it's fluffed up? I don't know if you can, but it really has fluffed up a lot. And we're going to gently stir this initial dose of egg whites in here. We're not going to worry too much about maintaining the loft of the egg whites at this point. Um, but we are going to be gentle because we don't want to beat all the air bubbles out of it that we've taken so much pain to create. All these air bubbles is what's going to give us our bread-like texture. Okay. Now we're going to do a little bit more until we have put in probably a total of a third of our egg white. I know this may look fussy, but if you just stir gently as I'm doing, just go down through the middle and fold over, down through the middle and fold back. It doesn't have to be completely uniform. There can be little white streaks and little chickeny streaks at this point, and you'll notice that, that the batter is super fluffy at this point. You'll be able to see the little air pockets. Now, at this point, the batter's gotten loose enough. I don't know if you can see it. it it's, it's almost loose enough to pour. And we're going to put it all down right into the bowl of egg whites. It seems fussy. I know it seems it may seem intimidating if you're not used to um, this kind of thing, but please try it. Now we're going to fold. We're going to go down through the middle and fold over. Then turn the bowl down through the middle and fold over. Turn the bowl down through the middle and fold over. And we're just going to keep doing that until it's mixed up enough. And we'll go around the edge once, turn, shake the batter off of the spatula as you go if you need to. Any of you who, like I said, have come from a home baking background, you'll see this is looking a whole lot like cake batter, which is a good thing. Now, we're almost done. You can see, I don't know if you can see, this is not 100% uniform. There are still little streaks of egg white. There are places where it's paler and places where it's darker. But that doesn't, it doesn't have to be. It's better for this to be a little bit undermixed than to be overmixed. Okay, we got our pan. And we're just gonna use our little spatula to scooch it into the corners. I would say scooch it gently into the corners because if you just mash it down, you're going to end up getting a big air pocket in the bottom. And, you know, not that that would wreck anything, but it could end up me. It could end up making it shaped funny to where it's like really thick on one edge and really thin on the other, on another. So this will make four good sized sandwiches worth of bread. Eight slices, by the way, I reckon. 
Now, you may wonder why, if I'm making bread, why I'm not making it in a loaf pan. I Every time I try to make a bread substitute like this in a loaf pan, for whatever reason, I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong, I have terrible slump that the top collapses, the sides collapse in, the bottom sucks up from it. It just ends up being shaped like a weird, uh, like some, like a bread loaf shaped balloon that somebody has let the air out of. And, um, I have no idea why it might be my oven, I suppose, but I have found that if I make these breads in a cake pan and make them flatbread style, I have way more luck and I get a way better texture. So this is what I do. If you want to try this in a, excuse me, in a loaf pan, uh, I would be really interested to know how it worked out for you. Okay. There's the oven. Here we go. We're going to put this in the oven at 350. The oven is, of course, preheated. Okay, precious friends. Now, that is going to have to cook in there for 30 minutes. And then it's going to have to stay in there with the oven off for 15 minutes. Okay? It has to cool slowly or else you're going to have slump. Okay? And a little bit of the moisture needs to bake off as well. Because that's going to also help keep the loaf from being too dense. So I'm going to pause the video again and we will see you again in 45 minutes. Okay. See you in a bit. We're back precious friends. Our bread is baked and it has cooled. Now what I did was I let it bake for 30 minutes in the preheated 350 degree oven and then I turned the oven off and I turned the baking pan upside down on the oven rack and let it sit in the oven for the turned off oven for 15 more minutes. At the end of that time I removed it from the oven, sat it still upside down, on a cooling rack on the countertop until it was cool, which was probably about 20 more minutes. So yeah, this is an investment in time. But look, look at the loft on it. It did not slump hardly at all. And this is what we're going for. This is why we cool it upside down. Again, with the angel food cake, they are cooled in their ring molds upside down. Now, I have my little plastic knife, which is what I always use when I have my metal uh, coated baking ware so I don't uh, scratch the coating. And we're gonna take this, we're gonna deep pan this, and we're gonna cut it and see what it looks like. This video is taking a long time and I don't want it to be too much longer anymore, so we're gonna loosen it, pull it out. It has slumped a little bit. You can see it, the, the, the bottom part has um, sucked in a little bit. That sometimes happens. There's nothing really you can do about that, but we're gonna cut this. I cut this size into four big, four big pieces and then I split the pieces and that makes eight pieces of bread. Look at the crumb. Does that not look like bread? It certainly does to me. So we're going to split this. This is still a tiny bit warm. There, look at that. This is chicken and eggs, people. And, you know, it doesn't taste like bread. You know, once you go to the carnivore lifestyle, um, you're going to have to, 
you're going to have to give up bread unless you want to indulge in the occasional cheat day. But if you want a sandwich or if you want uh, like a breakfast sandwich, a sausage patty, and a piece of cheese on here if you're going to do cheese, or what this is great is you spread it with a little butter and you brown it in a skillet and you can uh, make like fake French toast out of it and eat it with sugar-free pancake syrup if, if you like to do that. Um, I'll use some of my uh, low-carb jam that we covered in another episode. But what I'm going to do... eat it with a little bit of butter which I didn't soften my butter my butter dish is in the dishwasher so my butter was in the refrigerator so I didn't have time to leave it set out to I forgot to leave it set out to soften but I'll just mash it up a little bit mash the butter up a little bit and stick some on here it's cold, so it's not going to spread, but when you haven't had bread in a long time, that's going to be enough like bread and butter that it's probably really going to be satisfying. Um, this will also, I don't know if this will go in the toaster. I haven't tried that yet, but I know you can toast it in a skillet with a little butter on it, and that works really, really well. It doesn't get crispy, but it definitely tastes good. My husband likes to have this with butter and with the homemade jam that I make, and he also likes to have this browned, as I say, in the skillet and poured with a little bit of uh, sugar-free pancake syrup because he doesn't mind the sugar substitutes. I don't really either, but you have to do you. Anyway, that's it. This video's gone on long enough. I hope it's not so long that you'll be bored by it. I hope you'll try this. I'm really interested to hear how you feel about it, if you do. But that was it. Chicken bread, dairy-free. I'm going to wrap this up now. As I said, it's been, it's been too long already. I love you all. I wish you peace, love, and meat. And I will talk to you again soon. Bye.